uh, Benny will give the talk. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, the talk today is about complexity analysis of the S-Grid function uh, in the parallel random oracle model and its application in the proofs of space. But for time reason, I'm going to focus on the S-Grid function analysis and the mid part of proofs of space. The paper is my joint work with Joe Elvin, Chetan Kumar, Vladimir Komgrov, Krzysztof Piatrak from IST Austria, and also Stefano Tesaro from UCSB. Let's consider the following scenario. Um, a user wants to register a new account in a website. He'll input his login ID and a password, and the website will, will store the information um, in the server. And then later, when uh, the user logs in, the website will check if the password is consistent with the information in the server. But this kind of uh, uh, scheme is very insecure, as the hacker can hack the website, and the adversary can steal the information in the server, and so now he can also log in as another user, and more seriously is that the password will be leaked. So mostly a random hash function f is used. Instead of storing ID and the password pair, we store the ID and the hash of, uh, of the password, and also the thoughts. So now the website will check if the hash of the passwords is consistent with the server, uh, with the information in the server. But for now, the adversary, even he knows the information in the server, the only thing he can do to, uh, to log in as other user accounts is to enumerate all possible passwords until the hash of the password is consistent. So now the question is, what is the right function f should we use? And the answer is that we should use a moderately hard function f uh, we let C to be the least cost to compute function F. On the one hand, we hope that C is not too large so that the user can log in quickly. On the other hand, we hope C is not too small so that it's hard for an university to execute the brute force attack, as I mentioned before, with low cost. So what is the right cost metric of C? Should it be time, memory, or energy? So traditionally, the time complexity is considered well, we measure the cost by the running time of the computation. So mostly in practice, this, uh, the solution for this is to use the iteration scheme where we compute n random string, uh, n random string uh, iteratively as output the last label. But this kind of uh, scheme has a problem that's by the optimization of hardware, we can use some application-specific integral circuits, say ASICs, to speed up the high hashing power considerably at the equal time cost. So now the adversary using ASICs can compute multiple inputs um, in with the same time cost. So now the scheme is no longer safe against brute force attack. To motiv uh, so motivated by this, Percival in 2009 proposed the notion of sequential memory hardness. And the function f is called sequential memory hard if f on the one hand can be computed sequentially with a cost, for example, O n squared. But on the other hand, it should be not computed with cost much lower, um, like, for example, O n to the 2 minus epsilon for any constant epsilon larger than 0. And the right-hand requirement should uh, still satisfy even if the adversary can do the parallel computation. So in particular here, the cost means the size time complexity which is the multiplication of the memory size used in computation and also the time running time computation. This kind of uh, definition makes sense because it better reflects the money cost of computing a random hash function. Designing a sequential memory hard function has been a very, very important goal. So it is now the primary target for password hashing computation. There are many proposed designs for sequential memory hard functions. For example, Script, Katsina, argon2i, argon2d, and balloon hashing, and probably even more. But very few of this uh, scheme has a good proof of security analysis. So now in this paper, we will focus on analyzing uh, the core components of S script called Romix function. We'll give a better security analysis of this function. And uh, to note, note that the Romix function is very similar to the core components of argon2d, so our results will also has, uh, has extension to this. And in the rest of the talk, I'll just uh, use the script and Romix function interchangeably. By script, I also mean Romix function. So the construction of Romix function consists of two phases. It's based on a standard random hash function H, which can be implemented, for example, by SHA-256. And in the first phase, it's similar to the typical scheme that we compute n random string labels 
iteratively, and, um, and we will take the output as the input of the second phase, and the second phase will also compute n random string labels, but it here to compute a label, we'll compute a pseudo-random index ID from the previous label, for example, here is S, and we'll pick the corresponding X ID computed in the first phase, and we'll take the actual value of X ID and the previous label S, and evoke the hash function H once, and compute the next label. Okay, so, so on and so forth. And until finally we compute the last label, which is SN, so it's also the output of the ROMIX function. So we, we, um, the Percival claim this is a sequential memory hub function. And on the one hand, there is a strategy that computes this function rather, rather fast, but it will incur a large memory cost. The idea is to, that after um, the first phase, the adversary will remember all the labels computed in the first phase, which is XI. And in the second phase, to compute a label, after computing the corresponding index, the adversary can immediately recover the XID zero, since he already remember all of them. And now he can invoke H once and co compute the next label quickly. And since there are an N random string labels, then the total running time will be ON. And the memory size is also ON. On the other hand, if we only have a small memory, call, uh, memory we have to run this kind of func uh, function rather long for a long time. To see this is to compute a label. Now, after uh, we compute ID zero, we have to recover the X ID zero from the very beginning. That's from X one to X two to X three, and only after like ID number of steps, we can recover X ID and compute the next label. So, seeing there are n random string labels. And for each label, in expectation, you need to take O n steps. So in, in expectation, totally, you need to run O n square times. So you only use constant memory blocks, okay? So generally, as script, uh, Percival proves that under the random oracle model, well, we treat the function H as a random oracle, given a single input for any of the adversary who use space S n and time T n for any constant epsilon larger than zero the size time complexity is omega n to the two minus epsilon. And note in each step, the adversary can query bounded number of R inputs in parallel. So this is a sequential memory hub function. But is size time complexity really the right metric that we should use in the password hashing scenario? Because let's recall that the goal of the adversary in password, um, password hashing scenario is to compute the hash value of multiple passwords together with no, low cost. But uh, if we compute, uh, we can compute f function f on multiple inputs in parallel, can we guarantee that no matter of what strategy or adversary use, we still guarantee that the cost of computing them in parallel is approximately equal to the cost of computing them sequentially? But unfortunately, if we consider cost as a size time complexity, the answer is no. Why? Uh, let's imagine there is a function f, and on input one, the computing process is like this. In the first step, uh, the adversary have to incur a large memory cost, say n, but later on in each step, he only need to use one memory block in each step. But he needs to run uh, enough number of times, so say m number of steps to finish computation, so get to get the outputs. And the computing f on input two is similar. So now computing the both input sequentially has cost m multiplied two m because n is the memory size used and uh, 2m is the running time of computing them sequentially. So the cost is n multiplied 2m. But on the other hand, if we can compute them in parallel, we can achieve much lower cost. The idea is to shift the computation of input 2 a little bit. In the first step, we still compute input 1, which has memory cost n. But, uh, and in the second step, we continue computing input 1, but we also initiate computation of input 2. And we all, in this step, we have a memory cost n plus 1 and we keep on computing both inputs, so on and so forth, and after n plus one number of steps, we can generate output of both input one and input two. And this time, the corresponding size time complexity becomes n plus one multiplied n plus one, because running time is n plus one and memory size n plus one, and it's much lower than computing them sequentially. Therefore, size time complexity is not robust against computing multiple inputs it, um, to handle this problem, Alvin and Shubinko in 2015 proposed a new notion for the cumulative memory complexity in the PRO model. Um, and in PRO model, adversary after receiving inputs 
is that he can query a lot of parallel queries to the random oracles, and after receiving the outputs, he can generate a new memory state, S1, and then he can continue, continue compu uh, ask queries to the random oracle inputs and generate the second state, so on and so forth, until finally he can find, uh, generate the output of the function. And we define this uh, CMT, say cumulative memory complexity, to, of the adversary to be the sum of the memory state size through the whole computation. And basically, it is the cumulative sum of memory uses to the computation, and this is a group approximation to the, an important hardware metric called area time complexity, which is the product of runtime and error of the uh, circuit computation. Okay. A good property of CMC is that now it is robust against computing multiple inputs in parallel. So see the previous example, now the CMC becomes M plus M minus one. Because in the last M minus one step, we only use one memory block in each step. And computing them in parallel doesn't help anymore now, because you can see in the previous example, the CMC is two multiply M plus M minus one, which is the exact cost of computing them sequentially. So in general, AS15 proves that the CMC is robust against computing multiple inputs in parallel. So it is good to use the CMC instead of size of time complexity. So now let's revisit our memory hardness uh, definition. So now we would like to say that function f is memory hard if f, on the one hand, can be computed com um, sequentially with so CMT, for example, or n squared. On the other hand, cannot be computed with CMT much lower, even with the parallel computation power. And the first result is saying that under the Piron model, given a single input x for any adversary who computes s crib x, and for any constant epsilon larger than zero, the CMC is omega n to the two minus epsilon. And in each step, the adversary, in, that's like in the Piron model definition, can carry unbounded number of R inputs in parallel in one step. But this result holds true, so there's a caveat, holds true, uh, this uh, result holds true for arbitrary adversary only if we can re rely on a, we have to rely on a conjecture. So if the conjecture is not true, we may not say this. So if we don't want to rely on any conjecture, um, we may need to restrict the set of adversary in S3 computation. For example, may just consider a simple adversary which only store the random oracle's output in their memory states. But this, of course, is too restrictive. So there are definitely more powerful adversary. For example, in the adversary, after knowing several labels, he can choose to only memorize the XOR value of his labels. And then later on, as long in this figure, no, he knows any uh, three values out of four labels, he can generate the rest label for free. And this kind of functionality is not achievable by simple adversary. So generally, we consider a class of adversary called entangled adversary, where simple adversary is inside. And the, um, the entangled adversary says that for an, after knowing any sets of labels, he can choose to uh, generate an encoding of these label sets, where the size of the encoding can be any chosen integer t, and later on, as known as I know any L minus t labels in the sets, I can generate the rest of the labels for free. And our second result is saying that on the Piron model, given symbol input x for any entangled adversary, these results will hold true, and there's no, uh, no conjecture. But for simplicity, in this talk, um, we may just focus on the results with respect to simple adversary. But I emphasize that all the results will hold true in the entangled case. Okay, so now let's analyze the S3 function with respect to CMC. How do you analyze it? The idea of AS15 was to model the computation of memory half function by pebbling game, which is proposed by DWORK now and we in 2005. But note in their approach, uh, we require that the memory half function should be data independent, while s is not data independent. So their approach doesn't perfectly solve this problem, but uh, let's first introduce what pebbling game is, which is helpful. So in pebbling game, there's a particular graph which maps to a particular memory half function. Each node of a, a graph will maps to a particular label in the memory half function computation, and the age represents the dependency between the labels. For example, here, the value of L5 depends on the value of L3 and L4, so there's an age from three to, three to five and four to five. Moreover, the graph can be pebbled, 
So storing a label in the MHF is equivalent to storing a, a pebble node in the graph. And more generally, a memory state with size s in MHF can be mapped to a pebbling configuration with s pebbles. And the AS15 model the MHF computation by pebbling game. In particular, a computation with memory space s can be, pebble, uh, can be modeled by our pebbling game with s pebbles. So in each step, the adversary can do the following. First, he can put a pebble on node if all of his parents are pebbled. Um, and for example, here, since we can pebble one, uh, we already pebble one, two, three, we can simultaneously pebble four and five. And this corresponds to the pairing our inputs in the PRO model. And second, we can also remove any set of labels, uh, pebbles in the configuration. This corresponds to releasing memory in the MH of computation. And the goal of the verse three, oh, so here, yeah. So the goal of the verse three is to pebble the output nodes, which correspond to generate output function. Okay. So similar to the cumulative memory complexity, um, AS15 defines the corresponding parallel cumulative pebbling complexity, which is similar, is the minimum overall possible adversary, the sum of the configuration size. Where the configuration size means the number of pebbles in a pebbling configuration. And for example, in this figure, the best strategy is as follows. And the corresponding PCPC is eight. So now, uh, the natural question becomes, can we uh, model the computation of the SQL function with the pebbling game? But as I mentioned before, no, because the pebble graph is not fixed, we, uh, and the SQL function is data dependent. Why? Because the uh, ID we compute in the second phase is dependent on the uh, value of the label S. But fortunately, we propose a new game called the randomized pebbling game, which may help solve the problem. And we have production showing that the lower bound of PCPC for randomized pebbling game can give us a C CMC of SP function with respect to simple adversary. I note that we have similar results for lower bound of PCPC on a particular pebbling game and similar reduction for entangled adversary. But for simplicity, we just focus on simple adversary in this talk. So now it's sufficient to cons only consider randomized pebbling game and then analyze this PCPC to get a lower bound of S script. So essentially, randomized pebbling game model the second phase of S script function computation. There's a line graph with n nodes, where each node corresponding to a label computes in, in the first phase, which is xi. And initially, the adversary will choose an initial configuration p0. And in each round, the adversary will send a random challenge nodes, which correspond id. And now the adversary's task in this round is to pebble these nodes. And in each step, he can do whatever he does in the normal pebbling game. And after he pebbles it, the challenger will send a new random challenge, independent challenge, so on and so forth. And so in the second round, he also need to pebble it, so on and so forth, until finally the adversary succeeds in pebbling all n random challenge nodes. And we define the PCPC Exact, um, exactly similar to the normal pebbling game, which is the expect a minimum over all possible adversary, the expectation of the sum configuration size. Well, the randomness is taken over the adversary strategy, and more crucially also over the choice of the random challenges in each round. So our key lemma is say that the PCPC of randomized pebbling game can be lower bounded by omega n square over log n square. So Given this lemma, we can prove the S -cree bound for the uh, S -cree function. So next, I'll roughly introduce the pre, um, proof intuition of the lemma. Let's first consider the following problem. After fixing a configuration P, um, a new random chance is coming. And now the question is how long it takes to pebble this particular challenge. And we only care about time. And obviously, the best strategy is to find the nearest pebble nodes on the left and keep pebble it. And this figure, it takes three steps. And we define TIP to be the minimal number of steps to pebble a particular node I. And we define the potential of a configuration P to be the minimal expected number of steps to pebble a random challenge condition on configuration P. And certainly, we have that phi uh, P equals the sum of TIP divided by N since for a random challenge, it has n possible choices, 
and each choice has the same probability. And our idea now to prove the lemma is that we will move the adversary into a much simpler game. What, how to do that? That's for any adversary in a randomized pebbling game, let's see, before the JS challenge is coming, suppose the co uh, initial configuration is P0, and then the JS challenge is coming. And suppose it takes adversary to, uh, about k steps to pebble these challenge nodes and go on for the next round. And our observation is that k would be at least approximately around the potential of P0. And though we need a little more trick to argue it, but let's just assume it. So now uh, we will be able to put adversary into a new game which is much simpler but still careful analysis, that there is no random challenge, and the only constraint in each round is that we have to ask the adversary to take these k number of steps in this round. So more specific, we consider the expectation game. Initially, the adversary will take an initial configuration, P0, and now in each round, condition on the current confi uh, configuration P, the challenge will compute the potential of P and ask the adversary to take at least this number of steps in each round. So in the first round, uh, and then the adversary will obey the rule and uh, run this number of steps. And go on for the next round, and the challenger will compute the corresponding potential and ask to take this number of steps. And the game ends whenever the adversary uh, finish all n rounds. And we define the PCPC exactly the same as in the randomized pebbling game. And we have a reduction showing that the lower bound for PCPC of expectation game can give us a lower bound of PCPC for randomized pebbling game. So to prove the lemma is sufficient to analyze the expectation game now. And to analyze the PCPC of ex uh, expectation game, we rely on two uh, crucial observations. That's for any pebbling configuration P, first, the first lemma is that the size of the configuration multiply the potential of configuration is large, say omega n. Second, for a configuration P, after one step for configuration change, the corresponding potential can decrease by at most one. Based on these two properties, we can prove that the PCPC uh, in the expectation game is lower bounded by omega n squared over log n squared. This is one of the core theorems in the work, and, and but for time reason, more details can be found in the proof. So, Finally, uh, let's wrap up our results. So we give the first lower bound on cumulative memory complexity, which we think is, I think, better than size time complexity for S3 function with respect to entangled adversary. And under a conjecture, uh, our results will hold true for the arbitrary adversary. So it is an open question that whether our result holds true for arbitrary adversary without relying on any conjecture. And moreover, our proof technique has further applications in proofs, uh, in proofs of space. And more details about this can be found in the full version of the paper. Okay. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. We have time for questions. I think it's uh, still open as of today. Uh, uh, this, uh, you know, orbitary conjecture uh, is it still open. I think maybe it's still open, but uh, close to the answer. Still open. Okay. okay. But for arbitrary attackers, so. Yeah. So it's almost it's solved. Yeah. yeah, the thing is that the, uh, the conjecture, there are some attack for a conjecture that uh, make this things uh, uh, not tight, the reduction not tight. But maybe there are also other uh, uh, analysis or approach that without any conjecture, we can still prove the results. Yeah. Okay. So this log square n, I guess, just to make sure, what is uh, the, the tight? Uh, well, what, what do you expect? So is a 
a way to pebble it in a square over log n square step? Can you actually, is log, log square n, is it like close to tight? I mean, can oh. there like some? Log square is not Oh, that, that's okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so there is a better proof for this one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so let's send the speaker. Thank you.